as I mentioned at the end of the last video, part one, this is the second half of part two. <laughs> we talked so much and had so much to say. Uh, we just had enough material for almost two full episodes. So this is part two of the discussing the hard stuff, risk and resilience. Hope you enjoyed it. And welcome back. Today, we are talking with Dr. Gabriel Schneider on risk and resilience, discussing the hard stuff. Gav, let's look at um, some good leadership traits. Do you have any in mind that people should really be aware of and maybe we could watch for in others and Absolutely. maybe ourselves? Absolutely. So I'm going to share a little bit about what we've been doing in building our pre-resilience programs. So for those who are interested, feel free to email me or you can check out our new resilience education site because it's taken me seven years of teaching postgraduate psychology of risk to actually try and simplify the complex content and make it less academic and more practical. So in our postgrad programs, you know, it's about 80% practical, uh, 80% academic, 20% practical, and it takes about a year and a lot of reading and a lot of studying to, to get it. That's not to be able to do it, it's just to get it. So we've tried to bring that down into three or four days of education and switch it, flip it to make it go 80% practical, 20% academic. So I'm gonna give you the snapshot of that stuff. Um, we're only gonna be able to scratch the surface, but let's look at the key attributes, the key things we need to focus on. These are all attributes that are underpinned by the concept of what I like to refer to as situational leadership. And I think this is an important differentiator to, because you know, literally behind you on the screen is the term preparing for the unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> so when, we, when we're talking about that, we, we normally never get the AT when something goes wrong. You know, you normally never get the exact team that's rehearsed, practiced, learned to work with each other and are smooth at dealing with disruption. So, so with that lens in play, what we have to do is teach situational capability so that those who are at the best possible place at the, at the worst possible time can have significant impact. Right, so to do that, it starts with a lot of the research that was originally done by people like Carl Week and, and others. Okay, Perot, just to name a few, who did a lot of work into high reliability organizations. I know you're no stranger to that field. So when we look at high reliability organizations, I actually think um, the principles there were great, but they, 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 they actually need to modify now into a world of high performance, not just reliability. And we've built our education programs that way, where step one is reliability, step two is performance. And they're actually sequential. You know, if I can't even do it reliably, how can I do it to exceed expectations, for example? So it starts with, let's look at the actual traits. It starts first and foremost with situational awareness, vigilance, and mindfulness. If I can't even teach myself how to look around, identify things that could help me or hurt me, assess what needs to be done, and do it, or report it, then how am I going to be able to do that for an organization or my society? Mm -hmm. So, you know, to that point, you know, that's why I conveniently had one of these, but that's why literally I wrote the book on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so and, and it's a massive frustration for me because this is where most of these things fail. If the majority of negative incidents, and I say the majority because not everyone is, is preventable, but usually it's a failure in early identification, communication, or response that causes those to become crises or overwhelming. Then we've got to start at the beginning, which is teaching people to look around, okay, identify what's going on, assess it and act on it. But it's not enough to just do that. We, we have to realize that we've got limitations of uh, effort and focus. So we want to teach people to look for the most important things and this is where the, the psychology and the conundrum comes in, because what's important to me isn't necessarily important to you. That's and right. what's important yeah. to you and what's important to you and me might have nothing to do with what's important to the organization or society in general. True. So and, and this is the conundrum. You know, people often look at my career and they go, Gav, you're a martial arts bodyguard. What are you doing doing cultural change? <laughs> and the truth of it is, you know, if our people aren't engaged at an individual level to get the stuff. You can train people, build the best policy framework, plug in technology, it doesn't work. Or it only works to a fraction of its efficacy. Well, then they're not really um, 
following. A leader has to have follow. If they, you can make make them do things, but that doesn't mean they're st- going to follow you. And if nobody's following you, you're not a leader. Oh man, I, lo- I love these conversations. So you've given me one of the very important pieces. It's not one of the core attributes, but it is a core consideration. And that's this idea of leadership and followership. So in any high reliability or high performing organization, leaders know when to be followers and followers know when they should stand up to be leaders. And sometimes that is geographic, other times it's expertise based, but it becomes a network enablement piece as opposed to a lineal hierarchy. And and that's really important. We're gonna talk about some hacks later And that's one of those big hacks, which I hope we circle back to. But just getting back to key traits. So if we get situational awareness, vigilance, and mindfulness, there's a few psychological pieces that come under that, which I'm not going to explore now. Things like sense-making, meaning-making, emotional intelligence, okay, and arguably what I think is one of the most important missing pieces, risk intelligence, okay, which I I define risk intelligence as that ability um, and skill set. It's a living skill and applied attribute that enables you to act on upside opportunity while minimizing downside impact. Okay, There is probably a more articulate technical definition I've got in some of my papers, but if we don't have that skill set, you know, to, to actually look and go, hey, there's some downside with this, but let's manage that and carry on, grab the opportunity, then we're not risk intelligent. We're just risk averse, mm-hmm. which is where a lot of our societies are today. And a lot of businesses are that way too. You know, they'd rather prevent harm, then grab upside. And this is where research by, you know, a lot of uh, leading social psychologists, behavioral economists, people like Daniel Kahneman or Dan Ariely um, have have helped us realize that we will spend so much more energy to protect losing something we already have than to gain something that's potentially abstract. And humans are wired in these ways. So understanding a bit of human functioning, human psychology, you don't have to be an expert but arguably you're not going to be a great leader unless you fundamentally get some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's say situational awareness and it's underpinned by those pieces. The next piece, and I think this is one of those, it's thrown around so much, but we still suck at it, which is critical (laughs) thinking. And it's become even more important in the modern world because of information overload. You know, we, we, we can literally, you know, jump on the internet and you can find a web page that supports any sort of far out concept you can think of. Yeah. And, you know, then you present that as, hey, this is what the internet says. It must be true. So, you know, the challenge we've got now is really applying this critical thinking piece, but you can't apply it to everything again because it's energy expenditure. So I, I like to teach a very simple formula of urgency and importance there and in an ideal world, we'd spend all our time and effort on only what was urgent and important or just important. What tends to happen is we spend most of our time on things that are urgent and important or just urgent. And the stuff that's important, yeah, we kind of don't get there because, you know, that wasn't as urgent, not as pressing. Or we blatantly spend time on things that aren't important, you know, like uh, binge watching the next TV series on Netflix, <laughs> which, which, which gets the conundrum of, What's important for me might not be important for you or important for us because, you know, binge watching a series on Netflix might be a great idea if I've just come off a 72 hour, you know, highly uh, intensive shift on managing some sort of disruptive event. I need that downtime. Otherwise I can't perform. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of where it goes to the next piece. So if you think about it sequentially, situational awareness, mindfulness and vigilance, critical thinking, What's the point of critical thinking if we don't get to decision making? You know, we have to learn to make decisions. And this is the challenge because decision making is more art than science. And all the research shows us that most decisions are made with our intuition and subconscious, roughly 95% of decisions. So it's not simply a matter of going, hey, here's your next decision flowchart and just follow that. Or, you know, I, I think risk managers are the ultimate decision-making enablers. That's what we should be, right? We should be coaches that help decisions and help make the best possible decision, not people who tell you you have to fill in a five-by-five matrix and put together a 20-page report before you can do something. That's but we, compliance. We don't, but we don't give people the... Uh, we don't empower people to make decisions. 
where every time a decision needs to get made, it goes up that hierarchical level. Oh, you have to make the decision because I'm not empowered to do it. And then this person, because they're so far up, they don't know all the details that are down here, can't make the decision properly. And you end up with going off in a different tangent sometimes. I, and I've been on big programs and projects and in, in banking and disaster recovery, whatever, where that happens. We're, we're, not in, we're, you know, we're not allowed to make these decisions. It has to be the COO. And the COO makes a decision based on what they know which has nothing to do with where we need to be you know, <laughs> later on. It's well, who made the, the decision, you know, and everybody shakes their head. 100%. And uh, it's fascinating to see how this manifests because usually that's a failure. If you just run through the sequencing, we went through situational awareness already. That's a failure because the decision maker has limited or no situational awareness. Okay, then it becomes a failure of critical thinking because they're critically evaluating the wrong pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously their decision is flawed because of those two steps before. So part of the conundrum is to thrive in a world that is volatile and certain complex and ambiguous. You know, everybody throws around these terms like adaptability and resilience, but it does come back to a few pieces. And one of those is network enablement and multidimensional thinking. And those are huge terms that we could spend hours and hours unpacking. But simply put, let's talk about multidimensional thinking. Um, I was giving a lecture a few years ago to the Department of Defense. And afterwards, I had a, a guy from Army Intelligence come up to me. And he was, Gav, you're right. And I was like, that's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Can you <laughs> and tell said, me why? <laughs> yeah, 100%. That was exactly my response. And he said, well, you spoke about multidimensional thinking and decision making. For Army Intelligence, we've actually started calling that a combination of tactical and strategic. We call it tactical. And I said to him, that's so good, I'm borrowing that. <laughs> so now one of the things I try and teach is tactical thinking, where at the very least, people at the bottom of an organization, the most tactical you can get, understand the strategic impacts. And people at the top of the organization need to ensure they don't lose touch with what those tactical pieces are. So we actually, at the bare minimum, need to be tactical. I'd say that's the ticket to the game. In reality, we actually need to be four-dimensional. And I, I, I use something I call the ethical checklist, which is something we built to simplify this. If a decision is good for me, good for you, good for us, and good for the greater good, just do it. You don't need risk management. You don't need you know, to over-evaluate it. The problem we have is that very few decisions truly fit into that category that tick all four boxes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to be able to think on those four dimensions is really hard. So normally we just try and build tactical first, you know, just that ability. And this comes, you know, I'm a martial artist. There, there's, there's quite a bit of practice like this sort of stuff in martial arts and particularly in Zen Buddhism and those sort of things. And the way it was explained to me simply, and I was a very young kid at the time, but I thought that's pretty cool, was, you know, when you're faced with a dilemma or a problem, it's overwhelming because it's, you're the center of it for you. But if you simply visualize yourself on a cloud kilometers or miles above and you look down at the whole cascade of what you see, you see yourself as one person among thousands of other people with one problem and they probably have all those problems too. And all of a sudden your problem seems to shrink when you look at it in a bigger picture. So it's a very simple way to understand it, but people don't do it. We become intrinsically focused. I become driven by the whiff of what's in it for me. And particularly if our leaders are people who haven't been trained to lead, they've been trained to manage and might be displaying some sort of sociopathic, psychopathic, narcissistic tendencies, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. then that's the last thing they're going to be doing. Because all they're going to do is go, hey, what, do, what does this mean for my career? Yeah. And, you know, this, this links back to courage. Because if people like that don't have the courage to go, well, I'm making a call that might be unpopular or I have to make a call that goes against a policy statement, or I might actually have to go against what my boss says, or I might have to make a decision that's unpopular for one of those four groups I, discuss, I discussed, that takes courage. And, and in reality, without that, we, we actually cannot thrive in VUCA. All, all mm -hmm. we land up doing is surviving, uh, which is, which is you know, as, as I've previously explained to you, what we built with resilience, compliance, resilience, resilience, is not a bad resilience outcome because we survive, we're still in business, our people are still okay, 
but man, our people are broken afterwards. And most of the time, they are so frustrated with having survived an event. The last thing they want to do is be thinking about how do we prepare for the next one? Yeah. So yeah. Just, just building down the sequence, I'm just going to finish off that list of things. It'll take me another minute. So if we just recap situational awareness, vigilance and mindfulness, one, critical thinking, two, decision-making, three, it's not good enough just to make a decision. We either have to decide to act or not act. So acting or not acting is a critical piece. And this is one of those failure points I've seen in many of the clients we've consulted with and people we train. They can actually cognize and are quite good at doing the first three. Look around, gather info, evaluate it, critically assess it, um, make a decision, but then they don't necessarily ensure the action or inaction of that decision. And I'm quite careful to say that because good decision-making is sometimes we will not do something until we get more information or we are not going to do it. It's not always about saying, yes, we will do something. Well, some people actually think by making the decision, they have acted. Oh man, I love your work. So, and this is the <laughs> conundrum, right? Because when people go, I've decided not to do that. And residual risk is one of the best examples of that. Okay. Where people go, I'm not going to do that. And then they go, I don't need a risk management plan, a disaster recovery plan, a blah, 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 because I've decided not to do that. They think the risk goes away. Where in actual fact, that decision then either creates new risks or creates residual risk from not solving a problem or a conundrum or an issue that's bubbling away there. Mm -hmm. So part of what we've got to do, there's nothing wrong with, you know, a tactical or strategic pause to gather more information and make a better decision if you have the luxury of time. And one of the things I like to define a good decision is, is it's the best possible decision made in the most appropriate time frame based on verified intelligence. It's mm -hmm. quite simple when you put those criteria there. But then you look at most decisions being made, they're based on perception. They might be based on opinion. That, that opinion then gets critically evaluated. And at the end, somebody who is, let's say, a uh, status-driven leader may make a decision that's not good for anybody but them. Yeah, I was just going to say sometimes the decision is made in defense mode to protect oneself. What, most decisions, particularly the bigger the bureaucracy you work in, most decisions are made based on risk aversion, not on gain or solution, which is really scary. And this is why courage comes back into play. I look at how many times people tolerate uh, inappropriate workplace behavior or uh, even harassment and bullying because they, they, they're too scared to stand up for themselves or they're too scared to go, no, that's wrong. Yeah. And in, a, in the world we live in, which, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of the concept of political correctness, you know, having a set of rules that work for us not to offend minorities or people who may be sensitive. The challenge we've got is I think we've gone almost too far with that because if I can't tell you something that's good for you and good for me and good for us and good for the greater good because you will take offense to that, then it's a disenabler, not an enabler. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. a very awkward line to tread, but it, it comes, to, comes together with this idea of leadership and courage. Sometimes courage is just having a hard conversation and actually being able to do it. And it's kind of interesting, share a quick anecdote. Uh, my perception of toughness changed through my career. So when, when I was younger and I started competing in full contact martial arts, I was like, wow, those are tough people. You know, and then I got to that level where I was competing at that level. And I thought, that's great. I went to train overseas. I, I trained in what is arguably Israel's hardest school of full contact. Basically had this, the crap beaten out of me continuously for an extended period of time. <laughs> um, but eventually I got to the point where I, can, I could do that too. Then I came back to South Africa and got into the world of close protection and bodyguarding. And I saw these guys and girls who could work, you know, two, three days in a row, almost no sleep, under high stress, still perform, stay highly vigilant, respond to threats. And I was like, oh, wow, that's a different level of toughness. It's not just physical, it's mental. Mm -hmm. Then we started working with special forces. And I was like, wow, these guys can do that, you know, with not eating for five days. But to close that loop, it, and I'll say this with real confidence. I think some of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my business career was potentially let staff go or fire people. And, and none of those other things before were as tough as that. Um, you know, even running my own businesses for the last 20 years, we've had moments where it's been 
really tough. You know, we've had no money coming in. I had to self-fund some of the businesses for a period of time. I saw all my savings erode. We borrowed money. You know, thank goodness we've come out of that many years ago. <laughs> but that level of toughness and perseverance, it's harder than anything I've done physically or in a protective domain. Mm -hmm. So I think this is, the, this is the challenge. We keep thinking these things are easy. And in reality, it's not. It's not just about making that best possible decision in the most appropriate time frame, you know, based on intelligence. It's about acting or not acting on it. And then it's also about having the courage to actually go, I need to continuously review this and actually go, did I make the right call? Is it still the right call? And can I change that? And that one is so hard. You know, every standard mm -hmm. we look at, whether it's business continuity, ISA 31,000, they all have this plan, do, check, act, continuous improvement loop in there. But you just don't see that in practice. You don't necessarily see people actually going, hey, we didn't do that really well. How do we do that better? Yeah. So, yeah. so that part is tough, but it's really important. And, and to kind of close the loop on the, the, those key attributes, if we don't have self-awareness first, and there's lots of ways to get that, you know, mentors, coaches, personality assessments, honest review of your own performance, then you, you land up with a skewed view of what you're good and what you're not. And in essence, you're not primed to achieve. And I think there's a bigger piece here too in that a lot of the newer generations, so millennials, Gen Zs, et cetera, who are now in the workplace and working, you know, some of them have grown up without you know, necessarily having to do the self-reflection and overcome hard stuff. Mm -hmm. And they've been told they're wonderful and they're incredible and they're good at everything. And, you know, and it's just not the world we live in, right? None of us are. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So we've, we've also got to auto-correct that in the workplace too, which is tough to do. Yeah. I know you have to go in a, in a few minutes. So do you want to take a minute or two just as a closing uh, thought? And chances are pretty good. You'll be back so to cover other things you probably didn't get to today. But just as a, a kind of a closing thought. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. So I think the closing thought is this. It's really hard to, to make decisions that are unpopular. It's really hard to keep working on yourself and improving your own skill sets, capabilities. Uh, it's really hard to challenge your own thinking and actually go, maybe I'm the problem. It's harder to challenge other people's thinking. And it's certainly harder to have a, a robust societal or organizational impact. But it starts with you and it starts with courage and it starts with accepting the fact that situationally, the person who is there when something goes wrong is usually the best first responder. Mm -hmm. And if we don't empower our people to have the basic, I call them core skills, and we just describe what they are, that takes continuous work and effort. And it, it blows my mind that, you know, we finished a project with a, a large company now and um, they're in the rail sector and all this stuff, they hired us to run a program covering these core skills for the incident emergency management responders. And that ranged from the front line right up to the deputy CEO who were involved in the sequence. We trained nearly 300 people for them. And for some of those people, they've been dealing with incidents and emergencies and risk for one guy had been doing it for 40 years. This is the first time they were taught let's call them human and enablement factors. <laughs> so it takes courage to accept the fact that in a modern world, our systems approach is awesome. Don't get me wrong. You know, having a managerialism centric systems-based approach is great for consistency, for scalability. It's just not enough to thrive. It, it might just be enough to survive. Mm -hmm. And if, as uh, some people have been talking about, COVID not, is, might, might not be the big one, and maybe there's something bigger, more challenging, more disruptive around the corner. There's never been a better time to build those skill sets that will enable us to thrive for decades to come. So I'm hoping that some of your listeners uh, enjoyed this idea. It's not easy to build these skills. It takes work and commitment, but it arguably has never been easier now than it was before because you know, we've got virtual programs on this. More and more people are talking about it. But think multidimensionally, think networks, think continuous improvement, mm -hmm. and do the work. It's worth the return. Yeah. And I think that's the perfect spot to end today's show. 
Gav, it's always fantastic talking to you. I, I really like the ideas that you convey, you know, uh, especially about people and where things begin. And uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And I know we're going to have you back again for a fifth time. I, it's inevitable. I know I will. I'll be reaching I'm out. Very- somewhere. I, I know. So uh, I really enjoy it. So thank you for sharing your time and your expertise uh, today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Alex. And thanks, everyone, for listening. And I look forward to the next one. Please uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Reach out if you want to know more about this stuff. And appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Alex. Great. Well, my pleasure. And to everybody watching and listening, stay prepared, everybody. If you liked that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave a message and let me know what your thoughts are. If you'd like to be a guest on the show to talk about something related to business continuity, disaster management, COVID, personal well-being, anything that's relatable to those subjects, you can reach me through my LinkedIn profile, which is in the video description. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. In the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.